Uh oh. So pretty soon, I'm gonna be picking my Unreal Engine project back up, um, and I wanted to do some planning of some ideas I had on where I want to start when I go when I pick it back up. And the form that's gonna take is gonna be a GIMP image because I want to test some shit. Alright, layer, new layer, okay, it's going to be white, never find the fucking filled bucket, there it is, white, alright, so let's go ahead and do a square in the middle, about Yay, big. Um, so basically, I have this idea of how I can do interstellar travel with a particle system with no load screens or anything. And I need to get the visualization out of my head and onto something a little bit more concrete. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do here. Shape tool. I mean, I can just do do it like this, I guess. Layer, new layer. Select border. I should be fine. And then we'll just go ahead and paint this in. Oh God. Okay, so the idea that I have has to do with a particle system that's centered on the player. And we feed the data for the scanned planets and shit into that. It's the halfway mark. That means a third would be like... one and a half so if this is this would be the halfway mark right which means right here and right That's definitely not correct. We'll just eyeball it. The most important thing is the... Um, so let's go ahead and... 12.50 Twelve fifty, and it's four marks. Here and seventeen fifty four marks. Seventeen fifty four marks. All right, great. So now.
it's one of these plus four so right here and right here one of these plus four one of these plus four Select border five It needs double the divisions. I'm just gonna eyeball it. I need to be able to figure out the math of the complexity and having it be three I think is too small for me to really get a feel for how much additional power is needed. This is all in a 2D plane, but the the idea should translate to a 3D plane, so... Alright. Layer, okay. One more of these here. Select, border, okay. Paint. All right, now, um, layer, new from visible, all right, and let's pick out some colors, we'll say green is visible, We'll say blue is transitioning, and we'll say yellow is loading. Fuck. more of these actually double the resolution again so that there's a center line Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Shit. So I've made a mistake here. You can't just split it in half like this. This, this.
thinking. So to make this thing increase, it would have to be like this. And then you really do have a middle line. Divide by three instead of two. There we go, and now, so one of the things I want to find out here is the relationship the relationship between the volume of the inside square here and the borders in three-dimensional space. So, for instance, right here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a nine by nine square. And surrounding it we have one, two, three, okay, so nine, um, calculator, nine times nine is 81. Then on the outside we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 times 2 plus 18, 40. So we have 81 to 40. So the idea here is that as, so you can envision this as like the area we've scanned. I, I have like a conceptual model of the universe generated but it's not in, it's not like it's a conceptual model in that if you give it a coordinate it can tell you what's there but it doesn't know what's there ahead of time it has to calculate it so to display our surroundings in the universe we have to scan this conceptual model around us to figure out what's around us and you can think of this 2D plane as applying in 3D as well. So let's say the user is here. So let's say user is here, right? Then you could view this as like a cube around them and we're gonna scan and know the contents of every single one of these squares and then around it we're gonna have a series of squares where things transition in as they move through that and then around that you're gonna have a series of squares where things are being loaded in before they become visible and it's gonna take the user a very long time or not a very long it will take them a while to traverse a single square uh, because that's an entire solar system's worth of space. Where'd my fucking racer go? There. Oh god. 
Okay. And so my idea is, it's very expensive, this is very expensive to do. So my idea is that as the user crosses boundaries here, so I suppose I should go ahead and finish this. Select border, okay. Paintbrush, okay. Size is much bigger. Oopsie. Be about right here. All right, so now do select border five paint. Okay, one more here. Select border five paint. All right. This would be an example of a nine by nine search field. Now, the unknowns here is how do I translate motion for the user within this to motion for all the particles? That's going to be a challenge to figure out. So, like, Zooming in for a second. If the user's in this block of space and they move most of the way to this border, then as they're moving, it should be taking that into account for the um, particle system. And it should be like basically parallax scrolling the, the particle system around as the user moves. And then when the user crosses into a new space, so let's say so the user is here. The first thing we do as as we load the game is we scan the user's surroundings. And then we have another, and, and actually this, the surroundings that we scan are this bigger square. But everything in this square, this, this outer rim, will transition from at the max, like if the user is max distance away from it, it would be the smallest it can be. And then as the user gets closer and closer to it until they cross the threshold of one unit towards it, it would be, uh, it would have to be normal size. So it's, it's like as, as the user approaches these edges and gets close to them, the things that they're approaching are like scaling up until they cross this boundary and then they're just the size they're going to be. Um, And then, as the user transits that's too small. Um, hello, what's going on here? As the user transits to a different uh, select, as the user transits to a different square,
we would recalculate. So once we get here, we don't need to calculate these guys, but we'll need to calculate in front these guys. So it would be like here to here if we move this. And we would be recalculating just this branch of things and plugging them into our data set. Um, it might work. And then as things, as we move here, these get dumped out of the data set. Okay, so, and then next, layer new from visible. Actually, if I can get rid of what if I do it like this? Print screen, new layer, to new layer. Okay, and then turn this off this, this, and grab this, do this, do this, do this, And again, this doesn't have to be perfect. I just, I need help visualizing this. Uh, image guides, removal guides, okay. Um, layer, all right, duplicate, layer, transform, So we need one bucket surround, surrounding the known bucket that is constantly streaming entities in whenever you switch systems or streaming star system data in. But we don't display that ring. Then the next one, the next ring in from that so all of that stuff should be populated by the time it starts getting rendered is getting faded in basically based on the user's motion
so what does this actually look like in like pseudocode? So we have an integer range from local, let's say nine to stay with our, or actually in our demo, it would have been, we'll just say that this would be 10 to start. So you have the, so you have the, um, That's what that looks like. So, higher location, minus range. We're going to want the player offset.
Um, fade and bring. So to, so what is the what is the shell calculation look like here? It would be all right. So let's go ahead and get detailed with it. Maybe max. Um, X-Men equals the max of player X minus range min X Um, yeah, it's not the right scene, actually. Hang on just a second. I'm going to show you what I'm working on. Um, I'm kind of preparing to ramp back up on my project at some point. Uh, and I have this idea in my head. I have this idea in my head of how I can do interstellar transit without load, like without load screens. And it involves, um, so the drawing we were looking at was me trying to visualize what it would look like. So like, imagine this is in 3D. Um, and imagine that each of these squares represents a solar system worth of space. And your player is centered here. So the idea I have is I want to center a, basically put a particle system centered on the player, right? That will take all of, take all of the, um... So all the stars that it finds within this grid here would be displayed in full. All the stars in this grid here on this outer shell would transition in as you approach them. So as I approach this edge, these on this side would be getting would be scaling up to their full sizes until they pass the threshold, until I pass this edge threshold, in which case these would become part of this master set and you would have to load more. And then this final, the key here though, is I want a uh, multi, like I want a, a thread somewhere, not on the main thread, 
that is spinning um, always populating this ring of data, right? And this ring is not displayed. So basically, we're f as the users, as the players flying around doing stuff, uh, the first thing we do as the player loads the game is we we scan all of the space around the player and we populate this. And that's like your initial load time. So then you have your initial particle system for all the stars and shit that's going to be around you, right? Then, after that's done, we display it, we remove the load screen. And then as the user's playing... We're, we have another thread in the background that's always populating this ring of data around the data set that we're looking at. Um, it's just constantly scanning that until it's all scanned. Um, so, and then eventually all of these will be scanned and that scanning thread will rest until such a time as the user crosses over one of these thresholds at which point you would dump the data out of these out of your data set, right? Um, this row becomes your invisible row. This row becomes integrated into your fully visible. These become like fading in and you start loading the ring again, right? Uh, you start, you don't need these because you moved over here, but you start loading the outer, outer ring again. And so, so like the idea here is I basically want to be pre-caching the stars that you could travel to in your general area so that, and keep in mind that like, it's going to take a while to cross one of these blocks because this is like a whole solar system size. Um, so that as the user's moving around, in crossing these thresholds, we can start displaying the new stars that have already been loaded but are not displayed yet, while simultaneously another thread is populating the stars that we may need. Um, and the idea here is if I get this right, you would have a you would have a skybox with like nebulas and shit, or maybe not if you ever got if I ever got like the volumetric rendering shit. But you would have um, you wouldn't have a skybox with stars in it. Your stars would actually be just a um, particle array that is bound, centered on the player, and then is manipulated via like parallax motion kind of like trickery. Because like it wouldn't like this cloud of stars won't be actual size, right? Like maybe if my solar system's 80 million kilometers in one of these squares, the stars would be rendered in that block, like within that space, but will change the movement of the actual particle system is, itself, which is bound to the player's movement, to scale down the, um, the scrolling of them. So like, even if the stars are in a really smaller, like a smaller space, they'll feel like they're in a bigger space if they're moved intentionally at a fraction of the motion of the player's motion, right? So like if I have a star and it's showing that it's, and it's, it's actually in the game space 10 million kilometers away, right? That's how far it actually is. But as the player moves in that direction, I only move it one unit for every five units the player moves, even though that that particle is 10 million kilometers away from the player and the player is moving towards it, the whole system is centered on the player. So it will feel like it's 50 million away. Like it would take it would take you moving 50 million units in your local space to bring that particle to like right in front of you. Um, yeah, 
yeah and then and then what you would do then is that's when you start talking about like lod stuff yes yes okay so so this is um so this is what i'm showing here is just in the concept of in the context of stars right but remember our conceptual universe model that we left off of has stars stellar clusters and galactic clusters so you can repeat the same idea at the different scales right so our our coordinate system is uh negative 999 to positive 999 three times three layers deep so you have a grid of 999 to 99 uh, you have basically a 2000 width uh cube where each individual yeah maybe i mean this is definitely um an efficient way to do it it is a way to do it um and i th think there there's probably better ways to do it but like this is what this is what i came up with um <laughs> yeah yeah so and then once you get close enough to the particles that's where we start talking about like okay well then we use lod or something like that to sub in our actual like procedurally generated planet models and star models and such like that um but this would let you like go really fast and move towards a star and then as you get close enough to the star it swaps in and you swap in a solar system and shit like that the challenges i've got here are figuring out the translation of movement of the user within a single like unit of this because this would be like our max usable space so that you could think of this as like an 80 million unit cube in unreal right um so one of the biggest challenges and this is something i'm really fuzzy i don't know what the math is going to look like but it's going to be figuring out how to translate the user's motion within this smaller space to the motion of like the larger stars like we were just talking about um like obviously if i if let's say that i have my star system take up 80 million kilometers the full space that i have my my particle system the full space i have available to myself in one of these cubes right obviously i can't transit that whole star system by the time i transit this cube because it would look like i was flying through like an entire universe in in seconds um that's not ideal so what it needs to be is by the time i've moved from the center of this cube or from an edge of this cube to the other edge of this cube i've basically traveled like around the distance of one star to a neighbor star a next door neighbor star um, and so the whole particle system has to fudge the movement of those particles in such a way that, like, like we were just talking about, like you're degrading the user's full motion into a much smaller, like, actual motion effect of the particle system. Um, and so, like, you do this for the stars and then you go up a coordinate system level so the star the star calculations happen we have like level one galaxies level two clusters level three stars and each one of these is a 2000 unit cubed <laughs> that's a bad cubed that's a bad three cubed uh space for its search space um so we populate our stars from within this layer into a system like this and then we populate our surrounding clusters exactly the same way into a system like this in this layer but we use a different different coordinates right like here we're at our lowest coordinate scale here we don't care about our lowest coordinate scale 
we care about our middle coordinate scale and then finally we do the same thing with galaxies here and the sizes may change like I, not, I may not need to know 10 galaxies around me it may just need to be three or something like that and then what I can do is I can figure out okay well what are the particles for galaxies going to look like based on whatever and then that particle system can control the galaxies and the move the motion will be different it will not move nearly as much uh likewise for cl as clusters would likewise the clusters movement would be a lot slower than the star movement right um the like i this is a huge undertaking to make a system like this and i just barely have a grasp on the mental model of what it would look like but this is kind of what i want to set my mind to doing when i when i pick the task back up so i kind of wanted to hop on and just uh have a quick like brainstorming whiteboarding visualization type session to kind of think about how i'm going to approach this So the good news is I was already doing this kind of search space. Um, I already have this functionality working for statically displaying a star field. Um, and it was used in the skybox stuff that we did. Um, the difference here is the idea that it can't be on the main thread because when I put it on the main thread, if I got too big with it, I would get like it would think it's locked up because uh, it's a it's three nested for loops to do any of this so your complexity goes up real fucking fast and if you pick like if I would pick like 40 for instance as a distance or, or 50 it would just crash I could only do like 20 or 30 I think um, max of, of like the distance that you're you're scanning um, but with this, because you're, because the, I want to offload the runtime loading of these after the initial load into a secondary thread that just spins all the time. And because you're loading it as a shell, instead of an entire, like once you've calculated these, the inner nougat of this candy bar, as you move, you don't have to calculate these again anymore. So you can reduce the complexity a lot by just calculating the shell again, right? So if I go from this square to this square, this whole framework moves. I have to recalculate the shell like these values, but I don't have to recalculate most of the values in the data model. Um, and that's kind of what I'm relying on to make it run well. And then the other thing is that like we kind of get some natural um, some natural bonuses from just how fucking big everything is. This is one of these blocks is eighty million kilometers. It's gonna take the the user, at least it will eventually take the user, quite a while to transit. 40 million kilometers from the center of the square they're in to the edge where a load has to happen. That's a lot of time for the background thread to have to spin to populate these unseen stars in this outer ring. And then when you cross over a boundary, you already have the stars you're going to be phasing in cached. So you don't have to do like real-time loading. You shouldn't have any popping or anything. And now you've... And now you've crossed over another boundary. So to cross another boundary, you got to go 80 million more kilometers, which again is going to take a while. So you have plenty of time to cash. Um, yeah, I can shoot. I can try to answer a question. If I know, oops. So that's the gist of what I'm trying to puzzle out. 
I'm not going to actually do any dev tonight, but I have the day off tomorrow and I might do some. Fishing game, mini game using tiled data. Huh. I haven't thought about doing a fishing game, but I think that it probably wouldn't be too complicated to do one unless you were really trying to, like, go ham on it. Like, bear in mind the stuff that I do is, like, definitely not the shortest or easiest path uh, to do the stuff. I like trying to do hard shit. <laughs> Even if I fail, I like trying to do hard shit, so... <laughs> Something like, a interstellar travel with no load screens um some sort of spatial coordinate thing bad to be one tile deep um, I think that, well, it depends. Is it like a 2D or 3D? If you're talking about like a 2D tile-based system, uh, like a traditional, like, sprite-based type deal. Okay. So, if it was just a 2D, I would say you don't need any kind of depth information. Well, you could have depth information, but it could be like just a value on the tile right like you don't need an actual 3d model of it you could just say like this tile is 10 deep and this tile is 9 deep and then you have your code to like kind of make it gradually get deeper as you go out into the lake and, and stuff like that um and then you could use all the value all the data that you like you define like what are the properties of a tile of water so is it yeah, that kind of stuff. And then you use that data to do your proc gen of, like, what kind of fish are you going to get? Um, is it is there a fish in this square at all? Um, that kind of shit. Um, if you're just doing 2D. 3D, I don't actually... 3D is a little bit... I mean, I'm sure it's similar. Um, but I think with a 3D game, it, it's less about like a tile and it becomes more about like, oh, I have this actor, this fish actor in the pond and it's programmed to try to strike at this bait, this percentage of the time or something like that. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it, it becomes less about like the tiles and more about like the creature AI. Or Pokemon. Pokemon, very simple fishing system. <laughs> Gosh, I can't even remember fishing from Ocarina. It's been so long since I played that game. The other thing I want to check out is, I believe that Unreal may have put out an update that allows you to use World Height Offset with um, Nanite meshes. And that would help me a lot because then I could use like crazy dense spheres for the planets. Get a, get a you know, like a 4 million poly maybe like 20, 20 million polysphere to use for my planets and just have it be nanite with world height offset I don't know I, I don't have I'm not banking too heavily on that I'm also not entirely convinced that the way I did the conceptual model for the universe with just a bunch of nested um, structs was correct I almost feel after doing it once that I could have just standardized the structs for everything and just had uh, temperature, composition, uh, and then like a seed or something like that for every entity. And then rather than generating these structs 
ahead of time. We just roll the values that I would actually need to display. And then I would have like a system info generator that takes those small values and generates like uh, deterministically your like actual like more granular data. Um, I don't know. I like slight buyer's remorse on my implementation of that, but yes so that's kind of what i was thinking like rather than rather than trying to say like okay well i i have a a planet struct and it has these 20 properties i would just have uh like gal i would have like you know, galaxy data, uh, stellar cluster data, planet data, and each of those would just be temperature, composition, uh, size, or radius. Like, basically, all the information you need to display the thing. Like, the, the visual indicator, but not like the stats like, this planet has acid rain, you know, like that kind of shit. Like, that kind of shit can come in a second post-processing layer when you actually need to display that shit. Um, like when you're close enough to it to actually see the planets or see the star. At that point, you can then take that smaller set of data and use it to generate your like more detailed information that you need to show the more detailed models and such like that. It'd be an ass of work to rework it, though. I don't know if I want to do that immediately. So, like... I, I will admit, like, what I've built is a little bit overwhelming to work with. <laughs> Like there's so there's so much uh, I could have done like yeah yeah for sure um, so and, and remember like the way I, I figured out to do these is that you can do you can do all the proc gen with multiple textures you've got your noise layers. And then you've got like a color layer and they can correspond to, um, okay, that's fine. So where'd my doodad go? There it is. All right. So you have like your noise layer. Um, that one's pretty obvious what it does, but then you can have your temperature layer. So, so we thought that C could display as a UV texture, could input an image and see what system is generated. Yes. Uh, This way is a UV texture. Yeah, you could definitely do something along those lines. And I thought about that too. Um, I thought about the idea of, uh, I was doing all this work to generate the like conceptual model, but I also thought about the idea of using like a 3D texture uh, with some thresholding to generate the star maps. So basically like, you know, you can overlay textures in three different dimensions and then you can sample them 
and then like if a given point is past a certain threshold of brightness we light it all the way up to one it contains a star and if it's under that threshold we send it all the way to zero and then you end up with a 3d texture of like points of white in in a sea of black and then you can use those to generate star positions and stuff like that it's definitely a way to do it i i didn't go that route but i think you could um but what i was talking about here with like a temperature gradient is temperature and composition gradient is you can have your noises controlling your world height your like continental shelf and all that kind of stuff and then you can take another image and you can say oh as you go up this way that's your elevation right so like it becomes your elevation color map for the height map you generate with the um fuck i lost it i lost my train of thought the height map that you generate with the noises this can be like your height color map and then if i did a transition to like green on this side you could also you could say okay so the y-axis is going to be your height and the x-axis is going to be your composition and then uh using that you can come up with a bunch of variants and stuff within a single color swatch um So I was coming up with this, like the actual, I was having a hard time thinking about like the pseudo logic for doing the selection we were talking about. Uh, PX plus. Damn it. This is men. Okay. Insert actually come okay. I guess insert doesn't work in fucking notepad. So these are your loop ranges. These are the ranges for your three nested for loops for just the initial calculation. Um but what does a for loop look like? A, a three-way for loop that only calculates the shell. That's what I'm trying to think about. You know what I mean by shell? Like the... I don't care about the internal. So like rather than... Uh, x for y for z just pseudocode this gets you a cube right but i don't really want a cube i want like the eggshell of a cube I think it becomes uh, spherical is probably going to be overkill. This would work if I was doing it spherical, but like 
doing it with spheres makes all the math just substantially harder because now all of a sudden i mean it's not it's not something that we couldn't figure out it's just like it feels unnecessary um because it all of a sudden all your math needs sine cosine and tangents and shit uh versus just doing xyz cube math you know uh, I, I'm pretty sure we can figure this out though. So like we need, let's think about what, what, what we actually need here. So we need the, we need the, okay. So for X min, right? For X min, we need a loop through Y min to max and z min to max. That gets, so visualizing again, oops. Oh yeah, this is when I was ranked 666 in magic. <laughs> uh, visualizing again. Draw a quick cube, select none, or it's not a cube, but you get the idea. It's, it still applies to the, for, for the logic. So if we take X men, <laughs> uh, like not not like Professor Charles Xavier, but like x equals min, right? So that would be this value here, right? And for that, we need the full z range and the full y range. So that gets us this face, right? And then if we do the same for x max, we get that face. And then we just repeat that and flip it for all the other faces. And even though we have to do way more for loops, it's a smaller search space. So it's still going to take less time, even though we need multiple, we probably need more for loops to get it done. Um, because the actual amount that you're iterating is less. All right, so um, copy this. Right, so that would be an example of one face at x max, another face, and then and then we just have to change the letters around. Y Y. This becomes x z x x x x. Z, Z, this becomes Y, Y, X, 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 X. So these would be our for loops, each, each one of these representing a for loop here. So three for loops here, six for loops here, but your, uh, the quantity of iterations is dramatically smaller by like orders of magnitudes, even though you have to do more for loops. And like, if we think about it, we don't actually need six for loops. We need, four y min to y max, 4z min to z max um, populate x min 
min um, uh, for y, for z, populate x min with X men Y Z uh, and actually we populate calculate um, data for push to shell data set. So because, uh, and it makes sense if you think about a square, because we, we know for each of these two values will always be the same, we don't actually need two loops for this, for both of these. We can just populate both data points from inside the same point cycling through y, the y and z indexes. And you do the same thing for these other ones, right? Um, and then this would be and Z uh -huh. and then finally this is Z, we have X and Y, so we can just do X and Y. It doesn't particularly matter the order that we cycle through things. Calculate data for Z min, Z min, X, Y. All right. So this becomes the logic for calculating the shell or a shell given the max boundaries of the faces. So you need, uh, if your range was 10 and you wanted to count, calculate the shell outside of your range, then it would be wherever your position is at, minus 11, plus 11 in all directions to get the shell for your X-Men or like these values. And I wonder what the big O of this is compared to this. It's just two nested for loops for each one of these. So it's probably, this is probably O three in in cubed and this would be three in squared and this becomes something like that is definitely faster I mean it's faster assuming that your in value is bigger than three if your in value is smaller than three it's actually slower <laughs> And then as an additional part of this, you would be doing things like uh, world world origin rebasing. 
like when the player crosses the 80 million kilometers or negative 80 million kilometers from the origin in a given direction you would rebase that axis to the next cube like so if i if i go to 80 million and one it actually becomes negative 79 million in the next cube right And you have crossed a boundary and everything flips. Yeah, well, it's like, I wish I didn't have to rebase, but I think it's just a reality of the limitations of the hardware and... And then it like loads the outer shell as you're tra as you're transiting chunks. I mean, it absolutely makes sense for Minecraft because if you think about Minecraft, it's it's cubes all the way down. <laughs> this is going to be a heckin' undertaking, I think. But it's a nice meaty problem to sink teeth into. Uh huh. All right. All right. I think uh, I think that's probably going to be about it for tonight. I really wanted to just get some of this committed to paper. But I'm probably going to do some game dev tomorrow. I'm kind of burning out on video games. Alright. Later.